That is how, in fact, as a physicist, I think that's the most exciting one. Is how the receptor differentiate the molecule. Serious, think about that. You know, biology is not engineered. Biology is randomly generated by mutation and then under strong natural selections and it survives. So no one is going to design a particular receptor so that you can inhale the Starbucks caffeine and things like that and enjoy your fun. No. This somehow happened randomly. So how does this ever happen? If you think about it. That's debatable. That's debatable, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't want to offend too many people. So here is this amazing thing. So you might think that we have five kinds of receptors for taste, right? So that already made the Taiwanese culture. So as you live in Taiwan, you always know the most common thing when Taiwanese encounter something foreign, you know, we will just say, <laughs> is it edible, right? And if it's edible, the second question would be, is it delicious, right? So apparently taste is very important, but you only have five kinds of receptors. What about smell? Well, it turns out that everyone has a different kind, but typically, we have more than 350 functional kinds of receptors. And you might then immediately understand, in order to encode so many different kinds of receptors, this will occupy a huge portion in your precious coding, the DNA coding. So I don't know whether you can make a wild guess or not. Do anyone know that most of our, the top one percentage of the program codes uh, is for which systems for our body? Anyone knows? Biology test. Good. If you don't know, then I can introduce you that the first one you should appreciate. The, the first one, of course, is our immune system. Because they are fighting all enemies uh, 24 hours a day and more than 365 days a year. Otherwise, you will be doomed, basically. So that is the immune system. And to your great surprise, the number two comes to profession. So somehow we have been taking up such a huge chunk of genetic languages to encode this olfaction. And in fact, it's encoded in an extremely inefficient way. For instance, here, because of the resolution, you probably cannot see, that these are three different kinds of, of uh, olfactory receptors. And they only differ by 1%. But how is this encoded in our DNA? Instead of, if you just write a program, right, and then change the parameter, you should just have a variable and change the program. But that's not how we encode the olfactory receptor. We, we write a program. So it's almost as a really dumb student, oh, sorry, a dumb professor, and trying to do polymorphic cup simulation. And then, just by changing parameter, he rewrite a program with a different parameter. And then rewrite the program again with a different parameter. So it's uh, amazingly dumb, but then, well, that's actually how these guys uh, found us and then got the Nobel Prize. So this is surprising. <coughs> so how does this receptor work? Let's come to the next one. So this is a little bit technical, but let me try to walk you through. Because in biology, all biology processes uh, happen in cartoon. So it's actually not that simple. Well, not that, not that hard. So this is the order, the square order. And it does with the receptor. The receptor is bind to a G protein. The G protein will then basically trigger a sequences uh, of chemical reactions uh, in the cell. And at the end, either it will basically control the channels. And the channel will then change the electric potential of the cell. And then eventually it will fire. So the magic, usually biolog biologists are more interested in this part because this actually contain many of their prices here. But then they somehow take this for granted. They believe that you have a receptor, and then the ducking just uh, trigger it. But then you can seriously ask it, what triggered it? What happened? What's the theory of that? So let's look at the experimental part first. The smell is a really, really complicated language. In a sense, is that 
Okay, suppose now you have three different kind of receptors and three different kind of chemical compounds. And you can see for this compound, it triggers these two, but then with slightly different amplitudes. And this is trigger these two, and then this trigger these two, and all with different amplitudes. So it's not a one to one off of that. That's the problem. You have more than 350 kind of receptors, but then when you smell some molecules, this molecule can trigger more than one kind of receptors. And one kind of receptor can be triggered by many kinds of molecules. So this is a disaster. Okay? If this is a true language, this would be the most uh, complicated language you ever learn. So with all this, how can we ever really just smell that? Well, here comes the theory. So that's what we call the shape theory. So that's the current theory is that the molecular shape will determine how it smells. So the idea goes as this. In fact, this idea is not just uh, for olfactions. Uh, it also works for the whole drug industry. So if this is wrong, then something will be seriously wrong. So let's uh, walk it through. So what you find in the biological textbook is this. So a receptor is like a lock, a specific shape. And if the hormone or the neurotransmitter of the, in this case, the odorant match, then it just happens. Or you can, this is what you do when you're making a drug, is that if this is a natural hormone, it's trying to simulate the shape with a pin or something. And because this will trigger some action, so we call them agonist. And if you put in an agonist, you can presumably, even though not working very fine, but you should also be able to trigger the response. And what is really funny is that you can also take a little branch of uh, wood here, it sort of shares similar shape, right? And this is called antagonist. So antagonist is a molecule which doesn't trigger any response, but then it's stuck in the receptor. So the receptor cannot have any other responses. Okay. So to give you a very vivid idea, so you can basically ask yourself, so the other molecules are agonist or antagonist? It turns out that most of them are agonists. But then sometimes uh, you would have antagonist responses. So, so we need to get a little bit familiar with the agonist and antagonist. So antagonist is not inverse agonist, please. So yeah. So agonist is basically just some chemical which trigger the possible responses. Antagonist is occupying the receptor without doing anything. We have a saying for that. Yeah. Okay. Can you remember that? So this is the most uh, famous uh, antagonist, uh, caffeine. So if you plug the caffeine, this is what you found. And according to current theory, somehow caffeine is believed to have similar shape as another molecule called adenosine. Adenosine, yeah. Okay, adenosine. So you can actually. In fact, when I first tried to learn biology, I tried to convince myself, why, is, why are these two molecules called similar? <laughs> <laughs> and you will find that it's very tricky and it's an art to judge whether two molecules are similar or not in biology. And, but then, let me just, just sometimes now you just go back to the previous page and you're convinced that uh, this will be your caffeine, and that, well, this will be adenosine, the, the natural hormones, and this will be the caffeine that you're drinking every day. So what happened is the following. You can ask yourself that why you will have a sleeping disorder problem, but usually you don't have the inverse problem. Okay. Most people sometimes cannot get into the sleeping mode. Why? Because uh, to be to basically boost up your fitness in the wild, we are always on, unless you turn it off. So our neuron system is always on, unless you turn it off. Why? Well, because lion, tiger, and also animals will attack you out of your expectations, and you better keep in the on mode so that you can survive, right? We might have all known human beings as the past, maybe Neanderthal, but then they just got wiped out by us. 
So we're the living the unlearned. So how do you trigger yourself into sleep? Very simple. When the time hits, or when your body judge, then you should have some sleep. Then it will emit what we call the adenosine. And adenosine is an agonist. It will then trigger chemical to suppress your neuron activity, and then you will feel sleepy. So how does caffeine work? Supposedly, these two molecules are exactly the same. So you drink some caffeine, so, and your blood is full of caffeine, and this caffeine will bind with the receptor. So even if you are emitting adenosine, uh, it, it doesn't trigger the receptor anymore. So you don't have that chemical so, to put it into sleep. And that's how it works. But then you need to pay for it. Because the receptor will get used, and then eventually it gets stick to the caffeine better and better, or in terminology, that's the, the chemical affinity will be adjusted to be better and better, which means that at the very end of the day, when you get old, you will have serious uh, sleeping problems. Yeah, so that, that's the price that you probably need to pay 20 years ago. Well, 20 years later. Yeah. So that's the most, probably the most famous uh, agonist. Uh, this is not a smell, but as I said, that general theory works for all neuron receptors. So you should work for taste, then it should work for any other neuron receptor as well. In fact, this is the guiding principle of how we make uh, medicines. So when you have these big shop medicines and things like that, and we all know that sometimes when they try to make some medicine, and it turns out its side effect becomes uh, productible, right? And how does that happen? That's very simple. They look, basically look up some natural hormone and try to simulate it with uh, artificial molecules and then realize, oh, it doesn't work this way uh, they expect it. They have some other effect. And, yeah. So that's actually the, now, even though rather weak, but still the best uh, guiding principle you have in the drug industry. So apparently, if you learn physics, you might think that, no, this is not going to be the ultimate series of detection mechanism. But unfortunately, uh, it, it is. And if you think deeper than that, people will then try to convince you that any truth deeper than this cartoons is just too complicated beyond comprehension. So it's impossible. So let's see whether that's possible or not. So in 1996, so this guy, Luca Ture, he's not in the academy anymore. He, he published this and then basically got pushed out of the, the academy. Yeah. But it was good for him. He then just uh, find some grants and set up a company. He's rich now. Yeah. So, so his original idea is this. So, so be careful. I think physicists, to some extent, is probably still quite open-minded. Yeah. But, but not so is, uh, in all branches of science. This is a ferrocin and this is a nicocin. So how is this? This is basically a CHR. You can think about this. This is basically a Big Mac and this is a hamburger from Wendy. The only difference is that between these two sandwiches, C6, H6, inside is an ion and this is a nickel. So if you just check the molecular shape, the chemical affinity, they all look very similar. But these two smell differently. So Luca Ture, without knowing any physics, proposed a crazy idea. That is, the way that we can smell is because the olfactory receptor can detect molecular vibrations. How can this ever be true? You can first ask yourself, classically, okay? And by the way, he didn't know quantum mechanics at that time. At that time. He was trained in so this is a really crazy idea. That's why the, so many biologists hate him with passion. So you will see later. <laughs> so this is funny in the sense that if you think about that at room temperature, so molecular vibration is negligibly small. You have rotations and other things. And in fact, but then that also brings up another thing. So if the shape is so important, if the shape is so important, with thermal fluctuations, usually they rotate around. So it, it pretty much like a sphere with some angular distributions of uh, dipole moment, things like that. Seriously, the molecule at room temperature floating in the air 
don't really have the shape I just showed you. So if you think about this classically, none of this idea will work. But anyway, he proposed this and he called it vibration theories. And the paper behind has a, a very interesting story. The paper goes through the review process in nature. And eventually, the referee, even though he didn't agree, but decided that uh, the word should be known. So then the referee accepted. So after professional review, it has uh, this punctuate label it should appear in blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And at that time, the editor in chief in nature used the editorial power to just uh, remove the paper. That's pretty amazing, right? So if you're interested, you just uh, type in Luca Turing, and uh, he probably wrote a pretty popular book on this, and uh, there's a lot of it as well. Yeah, so it's pretty cute. <coughs> so let's see. So here you see this uh, Vasa, and Vasa is actually in the Vasa student. So they publish a paper, and then claims that there's no such thing. So. Because Luca Turing said that, well, the, our olfactory receptor can detect the vibration. So if you replace, for instance, the hydrogen with deuterium, the vibration frequency will change. But then the shape doesn't change. So then you shouldn't have significant isotope effect. So then later on, some people really hate this. So then they have done this. So this is truly amazing. I really wish that someday I can let me free that. This is so elegant. Such a short abstract. At present, no satisfactory theory exists to explain how a given molecule results in the precession of a particular smell. How does this mean? This means that no one knows. Okay, theory. <laughs> one theory is that olfactory sensory neurons detect intermolecular vibrations of the odorous molecule. That means that someone claims he knows. That's the second thing. We use psychophysical methods in humans to test this vibration theory of affection and find no evidence to support it. That means that this guy uh, doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. That's not, that's not a guess. Right? They just claim they cannot find evidence to support uh, it. Doesn't make it wrong. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Um, if you look up this paper, yeah. there is an editorial introduction of this paper. And it says, it basically says that why we take the pen to do the experiment, review this article and accept that is really because somehow vibration theory being dumb and incorrect somehow is propagated through our media in incorrect proportions. So that's why we published a paper to stop that. But, but this conclusion doesn't kill it. I know, but then you can talk to these guys. These guys hate Turing with passion. They have conferences just attacking him. And that's why that he didn't get his job renamed in UCL. Yeah, he used to work in University College London. But then, yeah. After he published this, uh, he just got fired. Yeah. So, well, things have a different twist. So after a while, people just accusing each other, and it was fun, but then not much of scientific progress is, uh, because most of the whole things was really emotional. Yeah, and I, I, I actually feel that if I have time, then I can share some personal story with you. With it. So here, let's uh, go back to physics. It's basically the way that you can detect isotope effect or not. So in 2011, MIT decided to ignore Wasserhaus' uh, negative result and then do this again. So what they do is that they use the acetophenol and the deteriorated acetophenol to test fruit flies. So why fruit flies? Well, because fruit flies are cheaper. So you can actually do tons of things. And if you perform this on uh, human beings, uh, it, it might also get into some local problems. Uh, and it turns out, if you basically just uh, use the deuterium H, as the phenol has eight hydrogens, and replace it with the deuterium and the original one, the fruit fly can detect it without any error. So it's pretty amazing. So the statistical significance uh, the, is huge. And they actually try this out. So everyone, different molecules uh, has a different kind of reaction and how you can differentiate or not, but apparently, uh, and one cool thing about these fruit flies 
these fruit flies are called virgin. Not, not because they have sexual sense, just because that when they were born, their nose never exposed to any molecule. So you want to believe. And once they smell this, they just kill them. So their only job is uh, show up here at the one data point, and then we just kill them. See, you cannot do this to human beings. <laughs> That's why we don't do this to human beings, because uh, this guy might drink Starbucks, and this guy might drink 7-Eleven coffees, and that would have a strong bias on whether you can differentiate the isotope or not. Yeah. So that's what we do, the, the cruel facts uh, behind this beautiful paper. So we now have the conclusion that fruit fly can smell. So after this paper published, uh, the biology communities uh, decided to level up the mystery of uh, olfaction. They say, okay, yes. So in fact, people check this, and this is correct. So we admit there is some mysterious effect when you change proton into a deuterium. But they don't call it isotope effect. It probably just due to some unknown reason. And so, good. They just add one more puzzle to this mysterious uh, Fashion. Great. And that's their reaction. So let's sort of stop it. And, but then later on, there are some neuroscientists who are interested in this. So this is really a good time to share this talk because uh, just like, wow, wow. You can change a new projector. It just shows up. Oh, the key point here. Okay, um, okay, let me just try to walk you through. So I didn't make this up. You can actually look at my computer. The data is there. So this just published uh, last month. So what they do is that they try this on bees, and even more crazy. When you try to do the full flight, and how do you know the isotope effect is not coming from your brain, right? And it's a collective animal behavior. Everything is so complicated. Maybe there, there are some maybe gradients there, right? And so the fruit fly just navigates through. Computer doesn't change the magnetic property. I know. Yeah. yeah. I was just joking. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are two complicated things. Why don't we just take out the neurons and see how they shine up the granuli? That is the knot of neurons, right? So that's good. So why don't we do that? Well, because this is very costly. It costs time, energy, and it costs lots of things. Unless this is an important issue, and most biologists don't think it's an important issue, so no one's going to do that. And so someone finally uh, decided to do this. So this is pretty amazing. So this is one receptor, this is another receptor. Let's just focus on the 37. The 37 sits here. So if you use the edge version, so this is a time axis, you will see positive responses of the yellow line. And trust me, when you change it to D, the positive signal becomes negative. What does this mean? That means uh, when you use acetophenol and the deuterionated acetophenol, the hydrogen version acts as an agonist. The deuterium version acts as an inverse agonist. And if you don't know how the words mean, it just means that it triggers complete opposite responses. How can you see that? You can actually map out these things. And let's concentrate on this. 37 means this red spot here. See? So the red spot basically means that you have pretty strong olfactory induced responses. But then, after you change the hydrogen to deuterium, the responses, not only got suppressed, it basically got suppressed to the other end. They become negative. And so since, oops, sorry. Since there is no brain involved at this point, this is really just neural conduction. So, so it's hard to believe somehow that these neurons somehow cheat along the way to the granulum. And you can also check other compounds and other things. And of course, here is a very beautiful result that if you stare at it, you will find that this color pattern are exactly the same. So that means that with some isotope changes, uh, nothing happens. But then most of the time, the patterns are different. So this is a very confirmed thing that we should look at this in a more careful way. That somehow, when you try to replace hydrogen with deuterium, our nose know. Well, okay. The bees know. The fruit fly knows. And supposedly we should know. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. No, no, no evidence uh, that we know yet. Well, that's pretty cool, right? So that's why that I think that maybe it's time that one needs to think that how this can be right. And it turns out the keyword is very, very simple. 
So what I just showed you in the previous 10 slides is the basically the fundamental theory in biology. That is the shape dominates everything. And you use classical transform equation. So I, after knowing these problems and then confirm with the experiments, uh, after MIT's experiment, not, not right now. Okay, I've been working on this uh, for more than seven years. So we come up with a crazy idea. What about we just quantize the shape theory? So what, what do we exactly mean quantize the shape theory? What, that's exactly what I mean. So I take the classical dynamics and quantize it, get quantum mechanics. So what do you got that? And it was so amazing, without any human parameters, that you would just have this sort of isotope effect. Okay? So I'm not the first one trying to write down a theory, but they, they did them for the first group of theories. Uh, they somehow don't like shape theory, so they don't have anything to relate to shape theory. So they decided to come from a completely different angle. And the first one is uh, published uh, in 2007 by Stonehan. Okay. So this is very complicated, but basically saying that uh, somehow the phonon, the vibration, will assist the quantum tenoring, and the quantum tenoring trigger how we smell. So that's the whole thing. So, so let's uh, dig into the detail and then give you some idea how this works. So notice that this is in 2007. So it's actually fun to work in this field. When the idea was proposed in 1996, but then the first paper trying to explain it and incorrectly is like uh, yeah, 2007. So it's a very slow paced field. So it's great. This yeah. is also yes, exactly. And Jennifer Brooks actually went to MIT. He got a fellowship. And that's why the, yeah, she convinced the experimental group to conduct. To, to conduct that experiment. So everything is linked back together. Yeah. Yes, it's a soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try to model the receptor. So it's very simple, right? So suppose, uh, what is a receptor? Receptor should at least have two states, and we are serious, so let's just uh, let it have two states. That's the simplest one. So it's uh, a receptor, okay, separated by some energy. But then you, you want the receptor can flip, and of course, then naively you would then say, oh, they should have some turn between them. Okay, but then this doesn't work. Why? Well, because very simple energy conservation. If this energy is small enough, you can overcome the energy mismatch, but then your receptor will be flipping randomly at room temperature, right? And if the delta is large enough, so it's robust against solar fluctuations, then it doesn't free. Fair. So, okay, nice try, but not enough. And of course, uh, this is not enough, right? This is actually good. This is nothing happens because the order didn't come closer to the receptor. So the receptor shouldn't fire. If the model files, then, then you are in big problems. So the second one is this. How do you model orderant? Well, this is the tricky part. For a physicist, uh, you just uh, model all sort of uh, red orderant as a simple red oscillator. So that is this bar here. But then what is the coupling? So here, Stonehouse proposed, maybe the simple amino oscillator will couple to the state differently, depends on where you are on state or off state. And once you add in this term, so it's great, you can actually start calculating. The term is possible. So what happens is that when a molecule ducks in, an off state can turn on to the off off state can turn on to an on state and lower the energy and thus down the energy to the orderant. And the orderant is dynamically docking and leaving the receptor and thus carry away the energy. So this is what we call an active type of receptor. Remember that for the vision is a, a passive type of receptor. When we see photons, uh, we take in energy and we also take in information. But here you can ask yourself, so when we smell, is it active or is it passive? If it is active, that means somehow the molecule you smell must carry some energy. And after you detect them, their energy will reduce. But it's impossible, right? You can actually do the experiment and there's no such thing happens at all. That's why that this seems to be plausible. 
Okay, and so what happens is basically that if this uh, frequency of the simple 